Hi everyone, this is Daryl from Calgary on August 24th and we're from, from uh, Crossroad of Truth Ministries at crossroadoftruth.org where you'll find all the notes for tonight's lesson. And we're going to um, be dealing with one of the most interesting um, topics that I think everyone will be able to relate to personally and, um, and, uh, and I think we're all going to be able to benefit from this because it's, it's one of those issues that we all struggle with. And I'm going to hopefully provide the biblical guidance for how to how to deal with this issue and how to overcome it. And um, so I hope you enjoy it. And I'll just open with a prayer. Dear Father, we thank you so much for this class and uh, for the, the number of people that are hungry for your word and that come out faithfully every week and that support this ministry. We thank you for blessing this ministry in so many ways. Um, it's, it, you're, we know your hand is upon it because uh, nothing could have been possible without you. We thank you for this room and uh, for the resources we have and for the freedom in this country that we still have to be able to learn about your word and to share the gospel with others. And um, I, uh, I also want to uh, just acknowledge uh, uh, that what you did on the cross uh, died for us for our, the forgiveness of our sins <clears throat> and, and to also acknowledge that um, I ask, I need forgiveness myself on a regular basis, and I ask tonight, dear Jesus, to please forgive me for any, any hidden sins of the heart I might have, any sins of pride, any sins of ambition, um, any, any, any sins of uh, just not, not trusting you enough. Uh, sometimes I, I don't trust you to lead this class, and I worry, and I take it on myself, uh, but I know ultimately I need to trust you and your Holy Spirit to lead this class and to say the words you want to say through me. So I pray tonight that, um, that you forgive me and, and use this confession as an example for others, as the remedy for how to overcome the greatest problem we will face in the flesh, which we'll learn about tonight. Amen. Tonight we're dealing, we're continuing our series with the um, spiritual warfare, we've called it in general, and I've been, you know, we've, been, we've covered a lot of ground in five classes, I think we've, um, but tonight we're we're dealing with what I'm calling the battle of the mind. Uh, we've we've alluded to this in previous classes, but this is really um, like I said, where everyone's going to be able to relate personally uh, to the struggles we have because this is a battle every single person has faced uh, that's been ever born, uh, except for Jesus Christ Himself. Um, so I hope that this is this class is a blessing to you. Um, to open with, um, this is a war against sin in the mind. I know throughout this this series we've been talking about it's a war against Satan and the devil, and and um, but really at its heart, on a practical everyday basis, this is a war against sin because sin is the result of Satan. So when I sometimes you know we could use sin and Satan almost synonymously when it comes to uh, how we win this victory in our Christian lives. I think it's actually more appropriate in more cases than not to think about sin as opposed to demons and Satan and things like that. Um, because when we talk about sin, we're really talking about Satan at the same time. So to open with, um, it's common to blame all that's bad on someone else or on some other circumstance that's external to your life. This is actually what the Bible calls covering your sin. And there's a couple of verses you can look up to you know, after, after to verify that. So the problem is inside of you. Sin is a matter of the heart. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, these are sins of the mind. And, and they take over the mind, the emotion, the affection, and, and our wills. And, in, and they will eventually manifest uh, themselves through our actions. Sinful behavior starts in the mind. It always starts in the mind. And I'll prove that shortly. And the mind is often referred to as the heart in the Bible. So when we're reading verses tonight that talk about the heart, we're really talking about the mind. And it always begins with temptation. We, we, we saw that with the temptations of Jesus and the temptations of Adam and Eve. Um, so it's always the beginning is temptation. Uh, the result is sin and then sin in the mind. And then it manifests itself through behavior. Uh, sin is very uh, – uh, sanctification – which is uh, separation from sin or to be made holy, it's really a work in your thought life. So if you want to live a sanctified life or, or a spirit-filled life, in other words, or in the, live in the promised land, as I sometimes refer to, this is really about winning the battle in your mind first. It's not about um, 
our conscious uh, uh, self uh, ability to, to not do certain things and, and do others. Uh, while sure, we certainly we do need a willingness to avoid sin and to obey God. Uh, if we don't, if we don't first conquer the battle in our mind and fill our mind with godly thoughts, which come to the Word, we will never win this battle. Sin is very deceptive, and it makes us think we don't have it by trusting in our own righteousness. And this is the downfall of losing the battle of the mind, self righteousness. I've had time and time again over the years of teaching these courses, people debate me whether. Uh, whether what whether they have sin, uh, some people actually think they have no need to repent for sin because they've been saved once and for all at the cross, and therefore there's no need to repent. Other people actually just don't call what I would call sin, what the Bible would call sin. They don't call it sin because they're able to somehow justify it in their mind to their self righteous approach to the world, and all that really reflects is a lack of knowledge of the Bible, and that's why they have these problems, these mental issues, and and emotional problems because they're not recognizing the root which is sin it's always sin it's never the circumstance you can't blame anyone else look inside and you'll find the answer um, the battle of the mind is a battle against sin that's my opening line for tonight and that may come to a surprise as a surprise to some of you it would certainly come as a surprise to the world who doesn't know anything about the kingdom of god the kingdom of satan or or the, or the things of, of the word they wouldn't understand this but we do, and I'm going to demonstrate that through this class today. Now, the Bible urges us to think. I'm not going to do a lesson on that. That would be another class in and of itself, but just a couple of uh, lines here. First Peter 1.13, he says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. In Isaiah 1.18, uh, God says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Uh, so the Lord wants us to think the, because he needs us to use our minds, dedicate our minds to his word. Um, and now just uh, you know, at another, to take another approach from the personal level, I'm just going to go up to the more global macro level here. And I've said here, the greatest issue in the world today is the battle for the minds of people. Evil forces today are currently brainwashing the entire world with new ideological thoughts and doctrine. We have seen the power of brainwashing in World War II and many other times in history. Minds can be coerced in many ways by force, i.e. torture, etc., uh, subliminal advertising, propaganda, um, drugs, becoming slaves of the experts instead of thinking for ourselves, etc. I put these points up because I think uh, this is very relevant for the times we're living in. I'm not going to go in any more depth about that. I just give you some things to think about. Uh, like I said, the devil is tr after our minds, not only our minds personally, but the minds of the world. And this is, and he's always working um, to brainwash us and get us to believe lies. And I think the world is falling into this type of thinking uh, on, on mass right now. So the only source of right thinking is the Bible. Anything that is contrary to the word is a lie, and it will result in wrong thinking. So right out of the gate, we know that the battle of the mind is sin, and the way to, way to overcome uh, that and get right thinking is through the word of God. So we need the word of God. This is the key. So I'm going to start with now a little, a few uh, scriptures. The importance of the mind. This is just a small uh, sampling here. But in Proverbs 4.23, it says, Guard your heart, which is really your mind. Guard your mind with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. So in the yellow box, my commentary, I've said we must be diligent in what we allow our minds to receive. And this would include common things like TV. What, which TV show are you going to watch when this class is over? Are you going to watch a secular Hollywood sh uh, show that, is, that has uh, murders and demonic uh, aspects to it? Or are you going to watch something more family-oriented or, or preferably even Christian-oriented? Or maybe not even watch TV at all is probably the best thing. But nevertheless, when we, when we make a choice on what we're going to watch or next what we're going to read, a book, or what games we might play, or might con some conversations we might entertain, we, we can potentially uh, leave our mind unguarded. And if we're going to let negative satanic thoughts in, um, we are going to pay a price for that. And it's going to manifest itself in wrong thinking and then sin. So Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinks in his heart, so he is. So your thoughts will actually determine your character. Everything you are, as, a, as the integrity of a person, your whole entire character, is the sum total of your thought life. 
Um, so if you want to put bad thoughts in, you're going, it's going to come out as, to, as manifesting as who you are. Isaiah 26.3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you, the Lord. So if you keep your mind on the Lord and you keep trusting on the Lord, you're going to be in perfect peace. It's all about the mind, isn't it? Keep your mind on eternal things, not on earthly things. We must keep our mind focused on trusting Jesus and the word. I think if you get nothing else out of this class tonight, that's actually the message. That's the key. That's the key to victory over sin and victory over the battle of the mind. But we'll come back to that at the end. Uh, uh, the, a couple of more verses. Um, 2 Corinthians 11.3 says, But I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So in the yellow box, I've said Satan tries to corrupt your mind. There it is. He's corrupting it. In the next verse, it says, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age have blinded, who do not believe. So Satan blinds. Not only does he corrupt, but he blinds us, but only if we don't believe. So the minds of unbelievers, they can't see. They're spiritually blind. They cannot discern spiritual truths. Now, back to this chart that I seems to get a lot of airplay now. I know uh, Carla used it, and Stevens used it, and I use it all the time. And I keep adding to it. It seems like it's always relevant. Um, when we started this uh, spiritual warfare, I added those first two yellow boxes saying that, um, well, basically this chart for people who haven't seen it before, this represents the spiritual journey um, with the imagery of uh, each, the Hebrews um, in Egypt as slaves. And that represents the natural man or the lost, unsaved person. Uh, they're spiritually dead. They cannot understand spiritual truths. That is the unbelieving world. That's the vast majority of people. They are living in Egypt from, from a, a spiritual metaphorical sense here. Uh, then when we cross the Red Sea, uh, that is symbolic of salvation. But when we're saved, we first enter the wilderness, just like Jesus had to go to the wilderness first. Um, as soon as the Israelites got freed from bondage of uh, physical slavery, they got, there they were stuck in the wilderness. But they had a choice. They could have crossed it in 11 days, but it took them 40 years because they wandered around in sin, not trusting God. And this is really what we face as in our journey. If we want to live uh, a victorious life, victorious life over sin, that is, or live a defeated life. So the wilderness journey, as it says here, is one where it's um, you're saved by faith in Christ, but you're defeated by sin. So this is your Christian, the church going Christian or believer in Christian, but is always seems to be beaten up and never really rejoicing in their salvation, never sharing the gospel or their testimony, um, always struggling uh, with resentment and things like this. That's a, that's, there's nothing sadder than that type of Christian because that's not how God wants us to live. Uh, and unfortunately, I think probably most Christians are somewhere in the wilderness. And as you can see, there's different extremes of the wilderness. There's one side that's almost, you're almost got your foot back in Egypt. You're loving your sin so much. And then there's the other side where you're, you're probably having victory some days and, and defeat the others, right? You're, you're up and down, the mountaintop uh, valley experience. Um, and then we have the promised land represented as crossing the Jordan River and living a spirit-filled life. And the Holy Spirit um, is, is given to us to, to overcome the power over sin primarily. And, that, uh, and, and as a result, will give us power in service for God and being useful to God. So we want to live a spirit-filled life or a sanctified life. And sin is the difference separating the wilderness from the promised land. So when we started this, we said the spiritual war um, in, is, is affecting everybody. Like the spiritual war is a universal um, battle going on in the kingdom of God against the kingdom of Satan all over. But we said that in the natural man, the spiritual war, Satan's main tactic is to keep people blinded in unbelief. If he can keep someone from, from saving faith in Jesus for their whole life, He's won the spiritual war for their soul. He's got them. And he didn't really have to do anything else. Everything else was just fun for Satan. All he really wants to do is keep you from, un from believing. But as soon as you start to believe, as we've talked about before, then the battle really begins. Then Satan makes himself visible to us as Christians because he wants to stop us at every, every chance he gets. And, and the, the main tools he will use, in a nutshell, are sin, uh, false teaching and false gospels, and division strife and envy uh, among you know, in the relationships that we have uh, these are just brought some broad categories because you notice the first one is sin so this is the war we're fighting as christians we already believe so we don't need to worry about the people in egypt 
but we got to fight the war of sin and the battle of our mind. And at the very top now, I've added this new line, and I've said your thought life will reflect where you are living. Um, at least that's what I believe. I believe if you have a, a thought life that's, uh, that's pure and, and mainly filled with the word, you are going to be, as a result, the Holy Spirit will work through you, through his word, and you will be in the promised land. You will be defeating sin um, with, with quite a bit, of, with relative ease in a sense, because you've replaced your sinful thoughts with godly thoughts. But if you are not going to stay in the word and you're going to think uh, you know, the ways of the world and watch secular TV and do every, every, all your conversations are secular about money and objects, material things, if that's what your conversations are about, you're probably living in the wilderness. If you may not know it, but that's, that would be a characteristic of someone that's, a car, that's thinking with carnal thoughts, worldly thoughts, material thoughts. Um, so this is where we want to learn how to get our thought life from being carnal thoughts into spiritual thoughts. Um, this little chart uh, summarizes the natural man, the carnal man, and the spirit-filled man. Um, th th this teaching primarily comes from Romans 8, 5 to 11. I'll just read it quickly. For those who live according to, their, to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is peace and life, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. And mind here means your thought life. It's a person's basic orientations, affection, and reasoning. So the natural man, this is the unsaved person, spiritually dead. Their mind is set on the things of the world, selfish and thoughtful, uh, selfish thoughts and desires. They're insensitive and unable to understand the things of God. This person has no conviction of sin and no desire to repent. The carnal man these are, these are represented as people who are saved. Uh, they've accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior and the sacrifice he made on the cross uh, for the forgiveness of their sins. They've done that, and that gets them into the kingdom of heaven. It gives them eternal life. But they are still living in the wilderness because of inward sins of the mind. And the marks of the carnal man, according to the Bible, are envy, strife, which is anger and uh, argumentative and stuff like that, and division. Um, the Bible is a closed book or a book for intellectual pleasure only, typically for this group of Christians. And a carnal man is generally useless to God. Uh, this person needs to confess and repent of their sin and nail that carnal sinner to the cross daily if necessary. Now, the spirit-filled person is concerned about godly things and deep longings for holy living to please God. Discernment is the main characteristic, the ability to know right from wrong. Even if they can't meet and combat apostasy and error, it can, it's recognizable, so at least they can be avoided and they can be protected from it. Um, and I think everyone that's you know mainly attending this class should be have pretty good discernment. We we uh, we recognize people come to that discernment through some of these teachings and recognize and make admissions that you know what they thought was true once they see it in the Word of God. You know now they they know the truth and they're able to discern false teaching once you have the truth. And the Holy Spirit will will prompt you. It, it will warn you in your heart when you're getting a false teaching or a lie, typically. Okay, so the battle, or the war is against thoughts, and the battle is for truth. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 6 says, For though we walk according to the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So uh, let's look at this a little more closely. Um, we see the word war here used twice in the same passage. So didn't I say that, that the, the, the battle of the mind is really a war against sin? So the spiritual armor um, weapons that are used are against our thoughts. That's what this is saying. Um, spiritual strongholds, so the first thing that we're, we're warring against says here are strongholds. Strongholds are lies or false beliefs, which are really thoughts, from Satan. Sin is what creates strongholds. And the only way to defeat falsehoods is by the sword of the Spirit or the word or the truth of God's word. And I just have a little footnote there, John 17, 17, uh, Jesus' high priestly prayer. He says, sanctify them by the truth. Thy word is thy truth. So we know how to get sanctified is by the truth, the word. Uh, so there's no, um, you know, secret magic uh, 
hidden uh, answers here. It's the word of God and faith in Christ. It always is and it always will be. Um, any thought that is contrary to God's word must be taken captive, as Paul says. So that means we need to recognize it. We need to recognize a lie so we can actually take it captive, right? And, uh, and if we know the truth, um, we'll be able to recognize those lies. Or if we, even, even if we're not necessarily Bible experts, but we're, we're saved and we're living a spirit-filled life, the Holy Spirit will, will tell us when something is not right. Um, I think that's all I'll say about that. But this is, uh, so strongholds and arguments, just to, just to uh, emphasize, this is about thoughts. Okay, the, so strongholds, um, incorrect thinking here I've called it. Literally speaking, a stronghold is a reference to a fortress that, which was used to defend cities from invading armies. And so when Paul was writing that to the Corinthians, uh, the Corinth would have actually had a, um, a fortress to protect that city. So Paul may have very, very well been using that as a metaphoric uh, example. But a stronghold, this is what it was used in that, le- in that era. So Satan establishes wrong ways of thinking in our minds, and they become strongholds, and they keep us captive in sin. In, in sin. And this can range from, you, know, you could probably make a list and have 100 things on here that could be strongholds. But here's just a few to give you some examples. So for instance, um, your worldview on evolution versus creation. You know, once you get a, 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 a view and you think it's evolution, you talk to someone that does, this is going to become a stronghold over time. And to, and to convince them otherwise it's going to be very difficult because it becomes entrenched in, in their belief system. Um, so philosophy, people who, who study philosophy and get these philosophical beliefs, again, it becomes strongholds. These are lies, remember, right? And you know, feminism, we talked about that in a prior class. How um, that is actually incorrect thinking. It goes against the biblical uh, way of um, teaching. But yet, people who, who get this view, because unbe- uh, beneath the the um, the cause is an ideology, and the ideology ultimately uh, points to satanic uh, you know, ways of thinking. And um, and so another example, completely different, is emotional damage from upbringing or relationships that create lies that we believe. So, you know, I, we probably all had emotional trauma at some point in our life, whether it's from our parents, uh, broken relationships, uh, circumstances we've got in, where we've been hurt and, and hurt badly. Um, and as a result, uh, many people create views of themselves or views of, of God based on these things. But this is these are satanic lies, right? As often they are, anyway. Uh, if they're negative views, um, you know, if we are forgetting that we're a child of God, we're forgiven, um, you know, if we're forgetting those kinds of concepts, then we're still believing the lie. And that's because these lies are strongholds. They're very hard to get rid of because they're ingrained in, in our in our common way of thinking. So even though we might love God, believe the Bible, if we're not willing to let go of these strongholds, uh, we're, we're going to live a defeated life in the wilderness. So we've got to be very open here to identifying strongholds and identifying sin. This is one of the objectives of this class here tonight is to get us to humble ourselves and to let down our, our pride and stop denying that we got it all figured out. If you are struggling in something mentally, I can guarantee it's sin and it's probably a stronghold. So let's let's try and get over that tonight. Um, the state of, This state of mind in particular takes the form of an argument, a false logic or a speculation that is contrary to the word of God. Isn't that something? Often these things are just speculations. We have even no proof for these things that we believe. Um, when we sin, we give Satan an opportunity to build strongholds in our minds. It's right from Ephesians 4.27. It may be that we rationalize the sin and as a result feel no need to confess it. I actually think that's probably the main reason. I, I see, I've talked to many people in these classes that have uh, debated uh, sin with me. And, and it's really just because they just don't want to admit that it's a sin. Um, you know, we all we all are sinners, and we all are sinning every day. So there's no shame in admitting uh, your sin. It, but there's more shame in not admitting it. To destroy strongholds, we must first identify them and then replace the lies with the truth of the Bible. Okay, the common roots of spiritual strongholds. Sin, I've already um, dealt with that already a lot. If we don't acknowledge and confess our sin, uh, and ask for forgiveness. We break our fellowship with God, and the devil has an opportunity to establish a stronghold in the unexposed sin in our lives. Um, other examples of strongholds are the lies. 
is the lies about God, yourself, and how God sees you. Um, the occult will absolutely um, and give, put strongholds in you. Engaging in the occult is an invitation for evil spirits to establish strongholds in your mind. And unforgiveness. I've highlighted unforgiveness and resentment a lot in this series, actually, because it's such a massive principle. Uh, and it's, it seems to always rear its ugly head in even the best Christian lives, including my, my own sometimes. Um, and it doesn't matter how small the unforgiveness is. It's still, you know, resentment and unforgiveness is still one of the, the great sins that's going to keep us in the wilderness, keep us uh, from living the life we, we could. So when we harbor bitterness against others, the devil will take advantage by keeping us in bondage. We forgive because Jesus Christ forgave us for an even greater sin against God. And secondly, we forgive because it sets us free from the bondage produced by bitterness. So if you're if you're finding yourself, um, you know, with um, uh, struggles in the mind, and 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 you're looking for a solution rather than, you know, I, I would actually kind of look at forgiveness pretty quickly, like right out of the gate, because often it's there. It might just be something that you're, you know, you're you're mad at someone at work for something. You might not think of it as, oh, I don't. I don't forgive them, but really at its root, that's really what it is. Right? If you're holding a, a resentment against someone, that's really forgive, unforgiveness. So we've got to get rid of that. We've talked about that before. Jesus says if, if you don't forgive um, people, your, the, the father, your father, father in heaven won't forgive you of your sins. So um, it's very important. Um, this little page here, I, I just want to emphasize the Christian life is warfare. I think I've given these verses before, but we've called this series – spiritual warfare um and i want you to realize this battle of the mind because we're all having it uh the whole world is probably struggling with with mental <laughs> issues more now than ever um, we'll deal with that in a little more in a couple slides here but but just so you know that this is warfare first timothy i'm just going to read the red here in first timothy 118 it says wage the good warfare second timothy 2 3 uh, he, he refers to christians as soldiers of jesus christ second timothy 2 4 no one in, entangled in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Second Timothy 4, 7, Paul says, I fought the good fight. Ephesians 6, 11 to 12 says, put on the whole armor of God. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. So this is a war, and it's a war in the mind. Jesus teaches on this in probably the, one of the most profound passages in, in Mark, I think. Um, so I'm going to read this passage and deal with it briefly. Uh, this really sums it all up. Um, Mark 7, 14 to 23. Jesus said, There is nothing that enters a man from the outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, hear let him hear. And he said, What comes out of a man that defiles a man, for what? For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts. Then he goes on. So he starts with evil thoughts. Then he lists, this is the first time Jesus has a long laundry list of sin, which follow right from thought. Adulteries, fortifications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So... In the right-hand side, I've said here, it is the heart or the inner thought life or the motives that make people unclean and is the source of sin. And, you know, if you, the, the Sermon on the Mount really ex exposits this in such great, beautiful depth. Um, it's, that's really all about Jesus explaining to people how the commandments, well, they're kind of do's and don'ts. And um, it, it, he, he explains that they're actually... It, he expands them to, to include our heart life or our thought life, right? So it's not just murder that's the sin. It's the thought of hating your brother. This is what he's saying here. Sin comes from the heart. So this list of sins begins with evil thoughts, and it, it implies that this first item leads to all the other specific sins. It combines actions and attitudes. So there we go. Uh, that's a lot of evidence, I think, to suggest that we've got to get control of this battle of the mind or we are done. Uh, so a summary of the situation. We are in a war against Satan and sin. The mind or the heart is the battlefield. Satan tries to take up strongholds or incorrect ways of thinking in our minds. 
And he does it through deliberate and crafty deceit and deception. So that's where we've come to this point. Um, I've got a couple of examples here. Uh, uh, you, you may be saved, pray, and get Christian counsel for problems, but if you don't recognize strongholds or preset ways of thinking, which are contrary to Scripture, you will remain in bondage or living in the wilderness. And for every negative thought, confess it as sinful and go to Scripture and correct it. These are very practical things. But I'm actually going to go on and later in this class and prove to you why these aren't just good, wise, practical things to do. They're actually essential scriptural remedies uh, for overcoming this, uh, these problems and winning the battle. Okay, um, beware of wrong thinking. Uh, don't think you, you can't be fooled by Satan into wrong thinking. Um, even Peter, in the height of his spiritual mountaintop, was rebuked by Satan, uh, by, uh, re rebuked by Jesus for this very thing. And in Matthew 16, 23, it says, But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. You are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. So isn't that amazing? The great apostle Peter, in the, in the height of his, of his life, when Jesus is uh, you know, giving him uh, praise about being a rock upon which his church is going to be built on, um, he then calls uh, Peter Satan because he wasn't mindful of the things of God. Isn't that something? Because Peter was expressing, uh, you know, why he didn't want Jesus to go to the cross and die. He didn't think that was a good idea. Peter, with all his wisdom, right, isn't that uh, well, <laughs> advising Jesus that maybe there's a better way? And obviously, um, Jesus called that Satan because that was incorrect thinking. Jesus had just told him he's going to go to the cross and die, and yet Peter we didn't uh, trust what Jesus was saying. Thought he had a better way. Uh, so this is this is probably what a lot of us do. When we, when we stop trusting in God and start trusting in our own philosophical or our own ways of thinking, uh, it can get us in a lot of trouble. So to win the battle, we use the word. Um, here's a couple of verses. The truth shall make you free from John 8. Jesus said, if you abide in my word and you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Isn't that, I, mean, I know we all know that verse, but now when we read it in this context that we're talking about, isn't that amazing how powerful this is? If we abide in the word, and we know the word is truth from John 17, 17, the truth will make us free, implying that when we're not in the word, we're not free. We're, we're under bondage by the lies of Satan in our mind, in our thoughts. So we need the word. The word, the, the word of God cleanses our mind with godly thinking. Um, the principle of measure in Mark 4, 24 to 25 I always seem to come back to this verse in so many classes, and I know it's rarely taught on, and a lot of people who haven't studied, it's, I think this verse is actually only in Mark, uh, uh, but it's so powerful, because what Jesus says is, take heed what you hear, for with the same measure you use, and, and this is in the context, it means a thought and study of the word, so the same amount of effort you put into to thinking and meditating on the word of God, this is what it means, it will be measured to you, and to those who hear, more will be given. And whoever has, to more, more will be given. Um, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. So what, what Jesus is saying there is if you put, the more time you invest in Bible studies like this, or personal morning watches where you're, you're reading the Bible and meditating on God's word, the more you do that, the Holy Spirit will bless you more. He'll actually reveal more to you. Whether, you. whether you know it or not, it's going to happen supernaturally. God, it's a promise by Jesus. But if you don't do that, if you think you can live this Christian life and not read your Bible, not go to church, um, not dedicate any amount of time at all to the Word, uh, Jesus says, what, what you did have, I'll take it away from you. And you'll become, you know, so I've heard people say, you know, you, the spiritual journey that we talked about in the front, you're never sitting still. We've talked about the spiritual war. You're never neutral. You're either going forward or you're going backward. Right? Um, so it all, and, and really it depends on, I think, on the Word of God is going to direct you. How to use the Word as a weapon. Um, these are just some uh, practical ways you could do that. You could pray using the Word. Uh, you could just, uh, you know, pray, you know, read a psalm and, and, and do it as a, a personal prayer at home alone. Uh, you could praise God using the Word by just quoting a Bible verse. You can meditate on the Word, read the Word every day. And you can speak the word to rebuke the devil like Jesus did in the wilderness. And, and so for all these four reasons, it's very important that we not only read the word, but try and memorize some of the word. 
And, and the more we read it, actually, we will memorize it, if nothing else, by osmosis. So we don't not need to all be, uh, have massive chunks of uh, scripture committed to memory, but although it is wise, I don't think anything but good could come from that. Um, but this just emphasizes how uh, to have a few verses, uh, certainly like Psalm 23 and many of the, the quotes of Jesus, it's, it's essential. It's a weapon. Uh, so we need spiritual weapons to fight Satan and to break strongholds. We need to know and trust the truth contained in the Bible to be set free from sinful thinking and defeat Satan. Um, so now I'm just going to look at society uh, a little bit here because we've talked uh, about now the scriptural, the theological way, and all that's fine. But let's look at the practical uh, reality of the world we're living in. You know, the society's solution to wrong thinking or mental illness or whatever uh, catchphrase they'll use for it uh, is often counseling, uh, prescription drugs, or possibly even institutional um, measures. Proverbs 4.23, to remind you, says, guard your heart or your mind with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. So uh, when we look at this, uh, what society prescribes versus what God prescribes, it's quite a bit different, isn't it? I, we just, I just gave you an, um, the last half hour of scriptural uh, prescription for wrong thinking, and I don't think you'll find any of that in secular society's um, advice for, for wrong thinking. In wrong thinking, that society will will deem as probably just anything that's uh, not compliant with the norms of society or, or whatever, you know, whatever they call mental illness. Um, and, and so my next slide, I, I just want to now, uh, this, this might be somewhat controversial to some people, but um, it's, I'm going to say it anyway. Um, Satan, pharmaceuticals, and the state of our society. Um, yeah, this I, is a slide I use in Mark, but the characteristics of the demoniac in Mark 5, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, read that or study this um but if you look at mark 5 and that that description of when jesus cast out the, the 2000 uh, or the legions of demons of the 2000 pigs of the demoniac the description of that demoniac is remarkably similar to drug addicts uh, i would i would even go further and say it's exactly the same as drug addicts in, 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 that are using hard drugs such as fentanyl heroin opioids etc um, that's very interesting. The Bible indicates there is a relationship to sorcery, witchcraft, and mind-altering drugs. Drugs, alcohol, sex, and pornography obsession all have the ability to change the neural pathways of the brain. That's called neuroplasticity, uh, thereby weakening one's ability to use their mind for spiritual warfare, i.e. capturing thoughts, renewing your mind, etc. All these things the Bible tells us to do. Um, how are we to be effective at doing that? if our mind has been numbed by outside influences, which ultimately are satanic outside influences, effectively putting handcuffs on our ability to think sharply. Um, mental illness, cutting, suicide, depression and isolation, extreme violence rates in society, they're all increasing rapidly, off the charts. Um, the, I, I, well, I, with, with the sexual uh, confusion in society, it's, it, it's now like, um, I, I don't have those numbers here, but it's, it's astounding. It's, um, in fact, I just read an article, I think it was last week, that said the CDC reported that one in four, I think it was people under 35, uh, considered suicide in the month of June 2020. And you can Google that if you want. That's a stat. 25% of the general population under 35 considered suicide in the month of June. Now, you tell me that's, that's ne we've never had stats like that. This is going off the charts. And um, so, yes, we, there's a big problem in the minds of the population here. Um, but now that's, I'm going to go further. Revelation 18.23, Galatians 5.19, contain the Greek word pharma, pharmakia. And it means sorcery, witchcraft, magic, potions, and it often involves medication and drugs. Um, Revelation 22.15 contains the Greek word pharmakia, and it means sorcerer, magician, or pharmacist, and and the pharmacy industry is actually named after the same Greek word pharmakia, and in there are over, uh, and and there are over currently over fifty percent of the population uh, right now in North America on some form of antidepressant or opioid, which in, which in other words are on mind altering drugs. So I I just I just say this as fact. Okay, I'm not I'm not even expressing an opinion. The Bible calls pharmakia from Satan. And it means uh, mind-altering drugs. 
uh, for the purposes of healing or something, right? So we should be very suspicious of anything that's going to alter our neurological pathways that comes from the pharmaceutical industry, in my opinion. Um, and now I just do this on, uh, for relevance, vaccine, vaccines uh, now use a radically different approach and you, that's right from the uh, CDC website that under vaccines, which I've got the link before. They actually say these new vaccines they're going to be using on us coming out are using a new and radical approach. And they use unethical ingredients such as aborted fetal tissues and animal cells that contain and introduce foreign DNA into its patients. Um, I brought some links here if you want to check those out. But that's that's pretty much all, all over the Internet now. Uh, that's a fact for the new vaccines that will be coming out. I won't say any more than that. Um, but I just put that all under the pharmaceutical industry because, you know, I know society, uh, even many Christians, and I know most pastors would be hesitant to say this, have this discussion, because probably half their church are on these drugs, and so they don't want to say it. But this is the reality. And so there, there is an alternative to, uh, to pharmaceutical drugs for depression, et cetera. And, and it's, the, it's the prescription we've given at the first half of this class. It's the word of God primarily. Um, I am 100% convinced of that. And uh, if people uh, are offended, well, I'm sorry, but that is that is what the Bible says. Um, and, and just an example here, I, I, made a, I made a point up there that 50% of the population are on some form of antidepressant or opioid. Um, below our links, 12.7% of people over 12 are on antidepressants, and 38% of the population of the United States were on a prescribed opioid in 2015. And I'll just... Um, in case that sounds hard to believe, uh, here's an article from CBS from 2015, so it's probably even higher now. More than one in three Americans were prescribed opioids in 2015. So you can see this is off the chart. Satan is, is completely controlling the minds of the population right now, and you have to think probably a lot of those people are Christians and going to church, and they're trying to fight this spiritual war with handcuffs around their brain directly from the pharmaceutical industry. So I just put this out there as food for thought for you. Uh, if you're, you know, you can do with it what you will, but uh, if you have loved ones or yourself ever considering um, these types of worldly prescriptions, at least now you have some biblical guidance. So the solution, Philippians 4, 8 to 9. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good, report. If there's any virtue and if there's any, anything praiseworthy in it, meditate on these things. Isn't that something? That's a great prescription. So there's, there's a good way to check your thought life is what you're thinking about on that list. <laughs> if it's not, then you probably, got, you probably got some incorrect thinking going on. And, being, and Romans 12 two says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Okay, um, I am going to uh, stop uh, this portion of the class now, and I'm going to restart um, with part two in, in one second. Um, so stay with us, and I'll be right back.